Thank you, colleagues. First item of business today is consideration of business motion 17860 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Business Bureau setting out a revised business programme. Uh, could I ask Morris Golden to move the motion on behalf of the Bureau? Moved. Thank you very much. Uh, no member wishes to speak on the motion, therefore the question is that motion 17860 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. So we're going to turn now to general questions. And our first question is from Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government for what reason there is a median disability pay gap of 26% in Social Security Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Social Security Scotland was established on the 1st of September 2018 and the majority of its workforce has been recruited since that date. The data used to determine the median disability gap was from December 2018 and is based on voluntary self-declaration. At that time, the disability status of 62.5% of the agency's rapidly growing workforce was unknown. The most recent staff survey highlighted that 22% of employees who have completed a survey within Social Security, Social Security Scotland identify as having a long-standing physical or mental health condition, illness, impairment or disability. And I'm proud that we have sought to recruit people in Social Security Scotland that are reflective of the society that we live in. Mark Griffin. The Cabinet Secretary knows that I've taken a keen interest in that the new agency employs and is representative of the very disabled people it will be supporting with billions of pounds of assistance. When I previously raised concerns about the agency's struggle to recruit disabled people, a member of so uh, Social Security Scotland's executive advisory body told me my focus almost entirely upon the external attributes and that to do so is a judgmental approach and accused me of misinformation and casting such deep aspersions publicly. And I would trust that the Cabinet Secretary would agree that attempts from a member of the executive advisory body to suppress legitimate and substantiated concerns about the recruitment of disabled people and by extension equal pay and promotion are simply unacceptable and would she commit today to bring forward a plan to close the gap in the, the pay gap in the agency and get more disabled people into positions of leadership to all levels of the organisation so that it does represent the disabled people it will serve. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I thank Mark Griffin for the, 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 the question because it is a, 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 an issue that I know he has been uh, particularly interested in. I hope he did, however, um, listen to my original answer when I talked about the fact that the staff survey has highlighted that 22% of the employees that completed the staff survey um, have a long-standing physical or mental health condition, etc. And that means they are representative of the communities that we are serving. The agency already has in place the great recruitment um, efforts to ensure that we are um, employing uh, those uh, with a disability. For example, in Dundee, we're working with Employ. And in Glasgow, we've recently had taster sessions with the Glasgow Disability Alliance. Both of, um, those um, all of those taster sessions were exceptionally uh, successful and we also have Inclusion Scotland offering placements for disabled candidates. We're also working internally to ensure that there is a great deal of focus on encouraging those who came in at entry level jobs, as the vast majority of jobs at the moment are within Social Security Scotland, to improve their prospects of internal promotions. And I would be more than happy to share that information that's already in place um, with, with Mark Griffin, because I do appreciate he's, he's very interested in this subject. And I'm very proud of what the agency has delivered and will continue to deliver in this area. Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. For the avoidance of doubt, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that disabled staff at the agency do not earn less than other people doing the same job? And can the Cabinet Secretary outline how the Scottish Government is working with disabled people's organisations to ensure Social Security Scotland is seen as an attractive and inclusive place for disabled people to work, and importantly, that we are not missing out on their talent and skills? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can absolutely confirm that staff working for Social Security Scotland are employed under the Scottish Government's main terms and conditions, which include standardised pay skills, and there we, therefore we are very confident that uh, we provide equal pay for equal work. I've mentioned some of the aspects. My original answer to Mark Griffin about the work that we are taking on with uh, disabled organisations to attract a diverse talent. The agency is also a disability confident um, employer, and we take part in the guaranteed interview scheme for people with disabilities, reducing barriers to 
employment. I hope that gives uh, the member and indeed the chamber some reassurance about the great deal of work that the agency is undertaking in this very important area. Question number two, Annie Wells. Government, how it is meeting its obje the objectives of its equally safe strategy? Uh, Minister uh, Officer, in November 2018, the Scottish Government and COSLA published our first equally safe annual report, which highlighted progress made on implementing the strategy and the delivery plan. Work is continuing to take forward important measures, including building understanding of consent and healthy relationship, tackling women's inequality, ensuring early and effective interventions for victims and survivors, and holding perpetrators to account for their actions. And we will continue to report on progress annually for the lifetime of the delivery plan. Annie Wills. I thank the Minister for that answer. Presiding officer, one of the objectives of the SNP uh, government strategy is that men who carry out violence against women and girls are held to account by the justice system. Yet the same SNP government is letting the vast majority of domestic abusers avoid jail in favour of soft touch community sentences. Community sentences, which according, community sentences which according to Scottish Women's Aid put women and children in danger why are the SNP refusing to exempt domestic abusers from their plan to abolish jail sentences for up to a year, as the Scottish Women's Aid and others have asked? Mr Yusuf, I think Mr McKelvey is answering the question. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> Presiding Officer. It's all teamwork in our government. Yes. Um, yes. I would want to emphasise the important relationship that this government has and values with Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid and other organisations. I know that they will continue to hold us to account in doing more to support victims of domestic abuse and tackling perpetrators. And we will continue to work constructively with them going forward. The Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef is ongoing with that work right now. But what I want to make absolutely clear is our commitment to tackling all forms of violence against women and girls yeah. through our equally safe strategy, which I have responsibility for. This includes action to support perpetrators of domestic abuse to change their behaviour and we have committed an additional 2.8 million over 2018 to 2020 to expand the innovative Caledonian system for domestic abuse programme so that more male perpetrators of domestic violence can receive specific rehabilitation services. Presiding officer, this complements our approach to holding perpetrators to account through the Domestic Abuse Act. And I know that our justice system will continue to give these matters serious attention. I'm going to gently remind uh, Annie Wells about the proposal from the UK government to ban short sentences. But I think I'll maybe not so gently remind her that our proposal is a presumption against short sentences, which gives sheriffs the discretion to put away domestic abusers at their own will. Shona Robertson to be followed by Tom Arthur. Shona Robertson. Coercive controlling behaviour has for a, a long time been a hidden aspect of domestic abuse. Does the Minister believe that the first conviction under the new domestic abuse law sends a clear signal that domestic abuse in any form will not be tolerated and also hopes will, will I hope will provide assurance to victims, giving them greater confidence to report all forms of abusive behaviour? Minister. Um, the commencement of the new Domestic Abuse Act, which was a great uh, event in this Parliament, marks a new area in Scotland which tackles domestic abuse. Coercive and controlling behaviour that has long been the hidden aspect of domestic abuse is increasingly being brought to the fore and highlighted as absolutely unacceptable. The first conviction is a positive start and sends a clear and unequivocal message that domestic abuse in any and all of its forums will not be tolerated in Scotland. There is only one person responsible for a, a abuse of behaviour and that is the perpetrator. I hope that the first conviction will provide reassurance to survivors that we take this abuse seriously and will hold perpetrators to account for their abusive behaviour. Tom Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Earlier this week I met with White Ribbon Scotland who recently teamed up with bookies across Renfrewshire as part of a campaign which saw scores of men sign the White Ribbon Scotland pledge to never commit, condone or remain silent about violence against women in all its forms. Will the Minister join me in thanking White Ribbon Scotland and all involved for, for running this positive campaign and disagree that the work of White Ribbon Scotland in changing men's attitudes makes a vital contribution to our shared goal of ending male violence in all its forms against women? Minister. 
Uh, presiding officer, I would wholeheartedly join with the member in extending my thanks and I am extremely grateful for the work of White Ribbon Scotland in highlighting the important role that men and boys have to play in promoting positive role models, changing men's attitudes and encouraging men and boys to recognise and call out male violence against women and girls in all of its forms. I have also taken a keen interest, in fact, taken part in my own constituency in this initiative and I look forward to continued engagement with White Ribbon Scotland who undoubtedly have a vital role to play in our shared goal of preventing and ultimately eradicating this type of violence. Thank you. Question number three, Fulton McGregor. And it's following on quite nicely from the last line of questioning. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce domestic abuse. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. It's the Scottish Government priority to tackle both the causes and the impacts of domestic abuse. The Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018, which we've just uh, heard about, which came into force in April, reflects the full spectrum of abuse that victims may suffer. Uh, criminal proceedings using new, new legislation are ongoing in courts across Scotland. Uh, and as Shona Robinson rightly said, uh, there's been one person already convicted and sentenced for the new offence. Uh, we have supported the delivery of training to over 14,000 police officers and frontline staff to rec in, in, in Police Scotland to recognise the dynamics of trauma and abuse. And we're also investing significant levels of funding for frontline services to help promote help support survivors of domestic abuse. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Uh, the Caledonian programme uh, seems to be making a huge difference already in areas where it has been rolled out and is gaining the confidence of sentencers up and down the country. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise when it's likely to be rolled out across the whole of the country, including in North Lanarkshire? Cabinet Secretary. I can thank Fulton McGregor for his question. I think it's a really important point to make. There are community disposals uh, available, and again, it's always at a share of discretion. Uh, some of those community alternatives uh, and disposals that could be uh, available are the likes of the Caledonian Project, which work uh, with um, the perpetrators of domestic abuse and work on the rehabilitation uh, of those uh, perpetrators to change uh, their behaviours. Uh, that's why we've invested uh, 2.8 million to expand that Caledonian system domestic abuse programme. 19 local authorities now benefit from Caledonian um, and uh, we support local government with £100 million for criminal justice social work. That includes, of course, uh, North Lanarkshire. In terms of a specific question about the Caledonian project, uh, I'll write to him in more detail about uh, the plans to roll that out to the remaining uh, local authorities. Thank you. Question four has not been lodged. Question number five, Gillian Martin. Side and officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to protect marine animals from entanglement. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government supports the Scottish Marine Animal Strandings Scheme, which investigates cause of death of marine animals, including entanglements. Through that, they contribute to the Scottish Entanglement Alliance Project, which aims to monitor and ultimately mitigate entanglements. Mandatory bycatch monitoring is carried out across the UK under EU regulations and delivered under contract through the University of St Andrew Bycatch Monitoring Programme. The Scottish Government are leading the development of the UK dolphin and porpoise conservation strategy, which includes actions on bycatch and entanglement. And this strategy will be subject to public consultation later in the year. Julian Martin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. An EMFF funded pro research project looking at cetacean entanglement is underway. Members of the project have called for piloting of measures to prevent or mitigate entanglement due to fishing gear, but have been told they need to establish the extent. In the last couple of months, we know two humpback whales have been drowned as a result <laughs> of entanglement, and last month, another juvenile humpback was spotted in the Firth of Forth entangled in fishing rope and netting. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she supports calls for this pilot and what other measures are in place to stop whales, dolphins, and seals have been tangled in our litter. Cabinet Secretary. The answer obviously outlined a, a range of uh, uh, work that is ongoing. Uh, obviously, I fully support the work of the Scottish Entanglement Alliance project to investigate the extent of the problem and provide an evidence base for proportionate mitigation strategies. However, any pilot fisheries measures should first be discussed with the regional in inshore fisheries groups before coming to the Scottish Government. Um, in 2017, the Scottish Government signed up to the Global Ghost Gear Initiative to tackle ghost fishing gear, which is often the reason for the problem. Uh, um, but of course, that is a global problem that does need global action. Thank you. Question number six, Elaine Smith. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps are being taken to ensure that the most appropriate support and services are in place for women in the prison system. 
Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. In 2015, my predecessor announced ambitious new plans for the future of female custodial estates. The Scottish Prison Service has a dedicated team and programme in place to deliver the Scottish Government's vision of transforming how Scotland cares for women in custody. Uh, SPS are working with a range of partners and stakeholders in developing a new model for managing and supporting women in custody in Scotland. This has included, included developing new custodial arrangements for women to ensure both the physical environment and the available services are gender specific and trauma informed. Uh, finally, SPS work with a range of statutory and third sector partners to deliver services to women, which include learning and skills, employability, physical activity and wellbeing, health, including mental health and support for addictions as well, and support for family engagement. Further needs-based services are available, including behavioural change programmes and bespoke trauma and bereavement services. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President. Obviously, I thank the Minister for his uh, informative answer. But there are changes to public policy taking place with regard to gender recognition at the moment without a law change, meaning that they are unregulated, uh, unscrutinised and specifically are affecting women in prison who are particularly vulnerable. Is the Minister aware that the SPS implemented its policy on gender identity with an EQIA that did not consider the effect on women prisoners or consult them? Does he agree that that was a deeply flawed process and will he ensure that the current review, which was referenced in the report by Women and Girls Scotland, will properly equality impact and risk assess any new policy proposal and involve a wide ranging consultation which includes female prisoners? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say to Elaine Smith, uh, of course I'll ensure that what she's mentioned, what she says, the concerns that she's reflected in her answer are part of that review. She's right to say that a review uh, is going on. It should be said that the SPS gender identity and gender reassignment policy was developed in partnership with a number of organisations, including Stonewall uh, and the Transgender Alliance, which was published in 2014. It's right five years on that that uh, is, is, is under review and that review is ongoing. There will also be a consultation, which will be part of that review, and it will be open for members across this chamber to feed in to that review. Notwithstanding that, uh, I will ensure that uh, a copy and a transcript of what uh, Lane Smith has said is passed on to SPS for them uh, to comment on. Margaret Mitchell. Yeah. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the high incidence of women in prison who are survivors of childhood sexual abuse, does the Cabinet Secretary agree cutting the availability of prison-based specialist services such as those provided by Open Secret Now Wellbeing Scotland is a retrograde step, resulting in the underlying problems which has often led to those women using alcohol and drugs to self-medicate not being addressed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say that you know, it would be better, of course, if the vast majority of these women were not in custody. And the presumption against short sentences, which she does not support, 90% of women that are in custody are in for 12 months or less. So they would disproportionately, in a good way, be affected that for, by that presumption. So it would be better if Margaret Mitchell and the Conservatives supported that presumption. That would mean less women in custody and more women perhaps being treated in the community and treated in relation to the problems around substance abuse and so on and so forth. But yes, of course, the premise of our question in and around services that are available, we will always continue to fund SPS for those important services uh, that are provided, but better, much better, that in sending, instead of sending women to prison, that the Conservatives supported our presumption and we were able to treat women in the community and treat the root causes of why they offend instead of just the symptoms. Thank you. Question number seven, Jenny Mara. I asked the Scottish Government for what reason the number of people starting modern apprenticeships reportedly fell by almost 12% in Dundee between 2017-18 and 18-19. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Modern apprenticeships are demand-led and as employers often recruit in cycles, including modern apprenticeships, starts can fluctuate year on year in any area. We have seen growth in apprenticeship starts throughout Scotland with record starts for the eighth year in a row. In Dundee, Skills Development Scotland, they're working with employers, partners and individuals to promote work-based learning opportunities, including apprenticeships. Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, I feel this 12% drop is particularly worrying given the economic situation we're in Dundee. The minister knows that there will be even fewer apprenticeship opportunities when Michelin closes next year. And 70 fewer apprenticeships after this minister's failure to support McGill Electrical. 
Will the government designate Dundee now as a priority area for apprenticeships and meet with me as soon as possible to discuss special measures to get young Dundonians into work? Minister. Well, in respect of McGill's, as the member has mentioned, of the 72 modern apprentices who were employed, there are 70 are no longer seeking alternative employment. Two who are, it continue to be supported. And in relation to the wider uh, labour market uh, position in respect of Dundee, uh, the, and against the context, of course, of record high uh, employment in Scotland, presiding officer, 75.9%, record low unemployment, 3.3%. Dundee last year actually saw the third highest increase in employment rate of any local authority area. With the support we're giving at Michelin, with the £150 million pounds we're putting in to the city deal, with that context of the market, there is plenty of opportunities for employers to take on apprentices in Dundee. Rather than getting our latest press release lined up, President yeah. Officer, why doesn't Ms Mara join with me in not only congratulating those employers for providing modern apprenticeship opportunities in Dundee, but encouraging other employers to take on more apprentices in Dundee and across Scotland.